during the coronavirus period, we used to get 800 samples every night, every night. And you can imagine for one or two people, it's very tough. How much is it usually? Like 800 is a lot compared to how many would you usually get? Um, so nowadays we'll probably get about, let's say 250. 250. 250. So and 250. that's on that's during daytime. This is during nighttime. Wow. So that's so a you can imagine. big jump. Yeah, it is a very big jump. So uh, all these testings, they cost a lot as well. You can imagine mm. the the extortion, the prices, um, it would jump. Like, uh, say, for example, a test nowadays, a test nowadays would cost, let's say, about five to ten pounds. During the period, the coronavirus, the COVID period, it would be about sixty-five pound, seventy-five pound per test per patient. Wow! And it's very expensive because it, it adds up in the end. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the fifth episode of the Tarikhology podcast with your host Muhammad Aminur Rahman. And today I'm joined by another other than one of the original co-founders of. Al Ghaya Foundation, which is now Tarikhology, Shah Kamal Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm, I am um, honored to have uh, joined this podcast today with Amin Rahman. Um, yeah, I'm glad to get the ball rolling from there. Ah, well, Jazakallah khayyan for attending. Uh, you're, I know you're a busy man. It's pretty hard to come across you nowadays. So I appreciate you taking your time out from the busy schedule to come today. So, Kamal, I know you and I've known you for a long time. But the audience probably doesn't. So tell me, for the audience, a bit about yourself. So uh, I grew up in the council, uh, council estate, Tower Hamlets. Um, I'm the oldest. I have uh, six younger brothers, one sister. Um, studied at the University of Westminster in uh, biomedical sciences. And from there, I gained uh, experience at Royal London Hospital, where I worked as a medical technical officer as part of the point of care team. And uh, yeah, I grabbed to, I managed to grab an opportunity where I work with Al Ghaya Foundation, where me and Amino first started um, this homeless project. And uh, yeah, is there anything else? I mean, no, that, that's good. Tell me about your journey. So what, what where were you born? How, how did that factor into you starting the, or co-founding okay. the charity? Um, any experiences, did they alter or impact your um, decision-making okay. processes? So I was born in uh, Royal London Hospital, where I eventually ended up working, which is a coincidence because no one would ever think, oh, because you're born in that hospital, you wouldn't think you'd end up working there as well later on in life. Fair enough. Which is um, crazy. And I'm glad that I had the experience and opportunity to work there. And, you know, I'm um, born there as well. Uh, what was the other question you asked? Alongside Growing that? up, did you have any experiences that made you decide, okay, I want to get... I want to give back to the community. I want to do something. Well, yes. So uh, growing up, you, growing up in an Asian household it can be quite difficult. As uh, many of the viewers that might be Asian, they would know. Uh, most of our parents would want us to become engineers, doctors, lawyers, you know, go through that route. But um, I had the initial plan that I was going to be a doctor. And of course, I didn't know what it would lead to. But uh, I didn't get the grades I want. Short story. Short story, I didn't get the grades I want. So I went into something a bit, a bit less than that, which was a uh, biomedical science. I mean, I won't downgrade that because it's still a degree and it's, uh, yeah. it's something that I can talk about. And it was, uh, I'm glad I took that route because uh, I wouldn't be here today and the person I am right now. And if I was to ask you, why did you, why biomedical science? I chose biomedical science because uh, I thought, you know, yeah, let's let's try the university route. Yeah, let's see how university life is so different to how school life was. And it opened my eyes a lot, actually, because uh, it made me realize um, maybe I didn't want to take the medicine route. Maybe this route was right for me. And uh, maybe I was meant to meant to ch take this path and discover on my own uh, what I wanted to do later on in life. Okay, that's, that's that's pretty interesting. So you chose biomedical science primar primarily because if I'm right, you wanted to do medicine at one point. That's correct. I wanted to do medicine, but because of the grades, I didn't get the grades because I'll be honest, I was a bit, when it came to GCSE's time, I feel like I was a bit laid back. I used to play football. I was, uh, I mean, I still came out with good grades, alhamdulillah, but I, uh, I don't think I'd changed the past and uh, the way it worked out for me was the best possible thing that could have happened nice i mean that was good so you went you studied biomedical science you did your three years you finished yep. what did you do after 
after that, I, um, you know, after graduating from university, it, the COVID period started, right? Mm. So the coronavirus period, it was very tough for a lot of people. A lot of the jobs became uh, remote. Uh, a lot of people, they started working from home as well because um, a lot of places shut down. Yeah. Um, so finding a job, I mean, I've, I was working at Marks and Spencer's at the time as well. Oh, okay, yes. So uh, while working in retail, it is very, it can be very tough, especially when, you know, customers come to you and ask you for a question, even the elderly. And because uh, Hamilton Hospital was right next to it, there were a lot of mental patients that would come in as well. Mm. So, you know, we had a fear as well. Uh, as work, working there but uh, we overcame these challenges um, and uh, the experience that I needed that would um, entail my my degree was very tough because a lot of these places were looking for experience you know when you just finish your degree a lot of people a lot of places they would ask ask for your experience they would say how do you know this person how do you know the manager yeah. it's either through connections that you'd get a job easily or it would be um it'd be very hard you, you'd need experience so i went through an agency and this agency sort of uh, helped me put my foot in the door mm. and this is one advice i'd give to everyone the moment you put your foot in the door to anything is the moment you've opened doors to many many opportunities so it doesn't matter if uh, you're working in the most hated job in the world as long as you have your foot in the door and you want to go to what you want to be then you'll make it definitely and that's that's something i did i worked very very hard to become a medical technical officer at this point so i started off as a band two and i worked in um histology so from there i think i got i got the worst job it for was, our viewers that don't know or maybe not from the uk what yeah. is histology Histology is the study of um, um, cells and tissues. So okay. uh, we, we would have like a microscopic slide and uh, from the microscopic slide, you'd uh, look into a microscope and you can tell wh how this patient died. So okay. um, oh, what's wrong with this patient? So we'd get different organs into the body where they would cut it up, put it onto a microscope slide and uh, later on they'll go for filing. So when it goes for filing, that's when you have to organize um, by year, by date, by specimen. And the doctors or the consultants, they would initially look at it and they would see what diagnosis they can make from it. And then from the diagnosis, they can make the treatment. But before they can make the treatment, there's like a whole group of consultants that come together and make a decision. Mm. So um, that was interesting because I had a scope, I had an overview of... Um, everything that was uh, going on in histology. Mm. And from histology, I thought, you know, there's no progression. I can't even, you know, apply for a permanent position. So what do I do? Mm. I went on to the track jobs. So yeah. uh, this is a, a website for NHS um, employees. Uh, it's for us to basically get our foot in the door again to a permanent position. Because yeah. now that I know the people, they said to me, oh, make sure you apply for this post, make sure you apply for this post. At least that way you'd have a chance, right? So you made connections prior to applying for external jobs? That's correct. And uh, I would say that my biggest help came from the higher up. So the band sixes, the seniors, they entailed my CV. They told me that my statement was off or on, what parts were good, what parts were not. Feedback is very important. Mm. And uh, from feedback is the only way you can learn from it. So what did I do? I used that experience. I used that um, template and um, I applied for a band free permanent, which was in virology so virology is the study of viruses so uh coronavirus is one of the samples that that used to come into the lab and we used to we used to do a lot of testing for it and uh, i'm glad that it was even though it was a fixed term contract mm. i feel like uh, i gained the necessary experience needed to um to work in very stressful situations mm. very overwhelming situations because during the coronavirus period we used to get 800 samples every night every night and you can imagine for one or two people it's very tough how much is it usually like 800 is a lot compared to how many would you usually get um so nowadays we'll probably get about let's say 250 250, 250. So 250. and that's on that's during daytime this is during nighttime wow so that's so a you can imagine big jump. yeah it is a very big jump so uh, all these testings they cost a lot as well you can imagine mm -hmm. the the extortion the prices um it would jump like, uh, say, for example, a test nowadays, a test nowadays would cost, let's say, about five to ten pounds. 
during the period, the coronavirus, the COVID period, it would be about 65 pounds, 75 pounds per test, per patient. Wow. And it's very expensive because it, it adds up in the end. And it, it makes sense why the government had to fund so much money, so much staffing um, was needed as well. It's uh, It was a very crazy time. And uh, from there, I think uh, gaining the experience I needed in different sections helped me gain the medical technical officer um, experience as well, which was um, working with... Um, so this is the name of an analyzer that we work with. It's called the Abbott. Mm. So what the Abbott does is it it tests the patient sample and it tells the patient whether they're positive or negative. And the good thing about this is the turnaround time. If it's quick, then it would give you the results. If it, if it detects the positive, it will tell you within a few minutes. And if it's negative, it takes about 10 minutes. Whereas the whole procedure of sending a sample into the lab and then getting the results, it will take about an hour or so. Or mm -hmm. maybe longer, maybe maybe yeah. for four or five hours. And imagine there is a lot of people that come into A and E. Yeah. And you know A and E, everyone hates it. Do you know why? Because <laughs> right. the waiting time. Yeah, okay, it's about me. six hours before everything is done. So it could take up to twelve hours. It's horrible. I mean, I was at the A and E for a friend not too long ago. Actually, I was in an A and E quite a few times because yeah. my friends seem to be very reckless. Yeah. But every time I've gone, we've always been in the A and E for at least. I'm thinking now. Four hours, five Four hours, hours. Six, I was with someone. And it's not bad. Four hours ain't bad because um, I'll be honest, you can't blame the workers because well, they're I, trying their best. Ultimately, everyone is doing the best that they can. Like, yes. We might assume that, oh, they're just sitting there. But out of a 12 hour shift, if they got to sit down for 10 minutes, I mean, mm -hmm. understandable. I was with uh, someone who injured his knee and he he was reluctant to go, but I pushed him to go to the A&E. Okay. We, got, we got there. And we were there for a long time. Wow. Like it, 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 I, I'm pretty sure it had passed midnight. And we got there after I finished work. So we probably would have gotten there around what, three, four o'clock. It hit midnight. Mm -hmm. And then one of his other friends came. See, and I, we yeah. were still there. And it was a very, uh, it was very long wait. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I guess that's the... I, hmm. I feel like one of the major issues NHS is facing is staffing. It, it, you can't be overstaffed and you can't be understaffed. understaffed. You have to know the right amount of staffing level that you need to accommodate to people because you don't want someone to be waiting six hours and someone else comes through and says i wait three hours 100 percent. but this isn't an nhs podcast no, 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 so we're not, we're not gonna but, um, get into let's, that uh, so let's carry on uh with the medical technical officer role i'm just glad i went to different sites and uh i think uh, you got the experience yes and uh, a week after that you called me about tarikhology and you told me are you interested in working with tarikhology and that's when i was like what is tarikhology tarikh means history and ology yeah. means the study of right good so the study of history is pretty interesting i've but, rubbed off on you oh. yeah i mean <laughs> arabic <laughs> but uh in um secondary school i mean yeah arabic paid off arabic, arabic paid off. Uh, and al Haya foundation that was what this previously was Called, right? Yes, it was. Um, was there a particular individ individual? Did anyone inspire or motivate yeah. you into starting? I, I would say um, the vision was definitely there from me. I was thinking, okay, how about we start a project? I used to think about every single mm. night. Uh, but one of my biggest inspiration would be you. Because okay. let me, this is the reason why. It's because uh, I remember you calling me and you were like, how about we start this? How about, what, what do you think of this idea? Do you think this will be a good idea? Yeah. Do you think people will love it? Do you think we'll do good? Our intention at the end of the day was, let's give back because yeah, we course. are so fortunate because around the world, there's so many unfortunate events of going course. on. Uh, we have two arms, two legs. We have um, eyes to see, we have ears to hear. You know, we have to appreciate what we have. So we thought, you know, let's start a homeless project. Let's go around, let's give the, the, the needy people what they of need, course. the less unfortunate. Um, so you told me, let's go around, let's make these bags, let's give dawa packs. Mm. And we thought, you know, the dawa packs is something very interesting, yeah. you know, because we're not only doing our work, we're doing God's work. Yeah, of course, the Lord's work. Yeah. Like and, that. um, you know, it took hours preparing those bags in your house. Do you remember the books? Oh, yes. We had books on the floor. We had, uh, video recordings of us putting it into the bags. We had, um, we had ideas. We, we had ideas, but the only problem was cost. We thought, how are we going to cover all of this by ourselves? So we thought, let's keep it to a, to a what's the word? Let's keep it to a limit. Let's well, see what we can afford. And yeah, what we can well, well, my initial uh, mindset or what the, the plan that I had was the most cost effective method for everything we do. There's no point in buying more stock than we needed. 
Mind you that I remember, I remember we used to store everything in my house. Yeah. There would just be boxes in the living room and my mom would just walk by and just see the boxes. And just, <laughs> she'd be confused because she'd, she'd ask, why are there boxes of like hundreds of Qurans in the, in the, in the box? Yeah. Or like different books. And obviously I told her what we're doing and she's like, oh, that's good. I, we've got a big team now. We've, I mean, got a, well, alhamdulillah, we've got a very big team. Alhamdulillah, when yeah. we started, it was just me and you. Yeah, I, I feel like storage space was a problem for us at first. I remember having my car and we would put the bags in the car so that we could go to different sort of areas. And We went across the entire Do you London remember? Borough. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was pretty interesting because it started off as more of, let's see how far we can go. Yeah, and then we we were getting good numbers, so we, we were we were it was working, but I feel like um, it, we had our good days and we had our bad days. Well, That's of course, what it was. I mean, when when I say we were getting good numbers, I mean yeah. in the sense that our confidence was increasing. Yes, we were more inspired to do it. Obviously, we went to some boroughs where there was no one. We didn't find any like, we didn't find any homeless people. People, no. But we, that could no. also be due to timing. Obviously, if we were, we went. Because we did this, it started Ramadan. Yeah. And we went before Iftar. So it was getting dark anyway. So yeah. we f we helped those we could. And I remember, obviously. I remember when you took your bags to your house, like you said, your mom looked at you weirdly or funny. What happened to me was I took the bags home. My mom was like, What is all of this? Why do you have all these bags? And I was like, Mom, I'm going to explain to you what this is. So this is a. Uh, these are bags. These are dawa bags. We're trying to tell um, people, the homeless, we're going to start off with the homeless people, you know. Um, this is our project. We want to give back to the community. Mm. We want to help you guys. If you don't have shelter, we have a list of shelters. Remember you had a list? And yes. It had all the show, uh, list of shelters of they can, where they can go to if they don't have a shelter uh, mm. company. Just to, uh, just to clarify that. So the Dawah pack for the audience, for mm -hmm. our viewers, was essentially, so it is consists of, as we show, we've shown in previous episodes. So it, now it's a box, but initially it was a bag with a copy of the Holy Quran. Yeah. We had, I think, eight books on Islam for like every audience. If yeah. you're non-Muslim, if you're an atheist, if you're Christian. Yeah. We also had a hand sanitizer because yeah. mind you that this was straight COVID after period. COVID. Yeah. So we had hand sanitizer in the bags. We had face masks. Yeah. We had, we there had was- Smudo sandwiches. Yeah. So there was, there was like a, like a, a meal sandwich, a drink. Yeah. Um, some we bought hot food depending on. Yeah, we, went the need. <laughs> we went to Mr. Cod. Yeah, we went to we went to a fast food chain and we bought yeah. some food. Yeah, and we also had a few pa papers with some. For example, there was depending on which area we were, I catered yeah. to that area. And for example, say we were in Tower Hamlets, then the local homeless shelters in Tower Hamlets were. So I, I I compiled all of that onto a word document. Yeah, and printed that out. And obviously that wasn't that. But then when we went to, for example, Newham. Mm -hmm. I areas. found all the homeless shelters in Newham, right. printed that down and obviously yeah. handed that out. Yes. Everything was tailored to the specific area. Yeah. When we ended up, and this was on a much later campaign, but when we eventually went to Sidcup, we went to Dartford. Yeah. Wow, you went really far. You, went really uh, far. you were with me. Yeah, like, you I, went really far. I, I, I remember that. That was, a, really that, was a, that was a... That was a... That was a very long trip, yeah. That was a very I, long trip, considering... <laughs> yeah, we, I think we've done, we, we've done a lot. I, I, would, I would like to apologize as well. I know I'm not wearing my hoodie, but it's in the future podcasts, fine. I will bring it. No, it's perfectly um, fine. In the uh, homeless project that we did carry out, I did wear the hoodie. Of course, one more um, I remember we went to, oh, this is an um, astonishing fact as well. We went to Wajipur and there was a homeless man there and he told us a story and it was, do you remember? Yes, was, I, I remember it was quite a few It was very emotional, very emotional. I, uh, I can't remember the full details of the story now, but um, he, it was, it was heart touching. I, that's all I can remember. He, he said that he has come across a lot of Muslims and he is very interested in Islam and he has books that he reads on. One thing which I found interesting was when we were in Shadow, and these are, there are photos of you doing this because I was not taking the photos, but we were in Shadow and there was a homeless person seated just near the park. Yeah. Now, when we went up to them and we offered them some like a dawah bag and obviously some food if they, if they requested it. Yeah. They took the dawah back, but they said no to the food. And they yeah. all they asked for was they just wanted to have a conversation with someone. That's it, yeah. They just so I remember have... you seated, you sat, and obviously I sat down as well. And you had a very lengthy conversation. It was like it was yeah. pretty long. Because I remember telling you, like, it's nearly iftar time. Yeah. We should eventually think about heading back. And one thing which I remember hearing from him, and you may you you reiterate this pre a lot, a lot, was the fact that he said that. He's, ha he's lived in like Tower Hamlets, he's lived in London yeah, his whole life. His whole life, yeah. But he's been around Muslims, but no Muslim has ever offered him a copy of the Quran. Oh, like yes, that, that for me was 
crazy. More, it was pretty crazy. The fact that we live in like Tower Hamlets. East London Mosque is just East London Mosque is down right at the Shadwell corner. Shadwell Mosque is there. We've, we have so many massages literally right in that location. Yeah. yeah. But no one has ever offered it to him. I guess it's because no one bats an eye. Think of the area. It's Tower Hamlets. So see, that, that, Mosque Bazaar, you know, a lot of uh, Asians go by. So I mean, they see him 100%. They see him. And I guess it, but, it's a testament to the work that needs to be done in the community. I feel like it's it's... The newer generation as well. It's like um, they they have their business. Someone else is doing their business. Everyone gets along with their own life. They mind their own business. I mean, it's not a bad thing, but it it can be a bad thing because you, if you don't pay attention to your people in the community, then how will you make sure that the community is safe? Exactly. And I always but, put it yeah. as if, imagine that was you. Now everyone ignored you because they were minding their own business. Now, when you put yes. yourself in those shoes... That's when everyone's like, oh, yeah, no, then I'll stop. Then I'll have my... The greatest gift you can give to someone is your time. 100%. And I, I, I really appreciate everyone that has worked on this podcast and every other campaign that we've done. And I obviously have shown my appreciation to you because without you, this would have just probably been a mere afterthought. <laughs> I guess so. I, I feel like I didn't put enough work into the organization as I should have, but that's because life got in the way. Um, I'm sure that the, the more projects there are, the more I can get involved. Um, in the future, this is something that I am uh, looking to incorporate in my life as well. Having this as a hobby, uh, side interest. Um, maybe there will be many more um, opportunities for me to participate in uh, Tarikhology's events. Definitely. Um, I mean, I did participate in the last one where yes. we had stores. And that was very interesting as well because uh, mm. that was the first time I've ever set up a store, helped set up a store, helped tell people, you know, um, there's a there's a store down here. Come check it out. You know, get yourself involved. Don't just uh, be part of... Um, one community be part of other communities get yourself it's like a social event you know yeah definitely um, people often think that that was just someone just standing on the corner shouting chronic verses at people yeah but they don't realize yeah. that i mean the perception um is it has to be seen differently it can't be seen one way if if you see that you know uh there's good intentions behind it go towards the good you don't want to mix yourself in the bad but then again what is bad what is bad company what, yeah, what? exactly and that, that's what i was alluding to how there's a there's usually a not so positive um, perception when it comes to like da'wah or da'is in general. And uh, one of our previous guests, Sheikh Muhammad Mahmoud, he spoke about the etiquette that a da'i, someone who calls to Islam, should have. Mm -hmm. But I feel, as if, I feel as if we haven't given as much importance, especially growing up like in the West. Yeah. Da'wah is not given that much importance. It's not. And I feel like many of those who are already Muslims, they still don't know a lot about Islam. I mean... Um, Ruling wise, if um, you know how there's a lot of opinions, a lot of differences. Uh, some people think, oh, this is correct. Some people think this is correct. I think uh, a lot of the youth nowadays, they're misguided in the sense that they don't know what's right and what's wrong within Islam. I think that's where we should also step in and tell them, you know, just stick to the basics. Just stick to what you know. Don't go any further than that. I mean, yeah, that's a good point, which is why we stick to the scholarly line. We have school, we have scholars who have been taught by scholars leading all the way back down to the time of the Prophet وسلم, and there's no need to reinvent the wheel no if if you're unsure of something I think the best course is to ask someone who's learned a scholar someone who knows the subject instead of just going on to Google Googling the answer that might cause more problems and 100%, solutions 100% I just wanted to say You've come a long way with, <laughs> with this, with Tarikhology. I, I'm very proud of I what that. I've left you with and what I've come back to you with. Okay, this comes on to the next question. Right. Based off of when you eventually took some time off Al Ghaya Foundation, obviously you started a new job and now you're trying to get back into the work life. Right. From then till now, would you say that we've, got, we've increased in our like, productivity? 100%. I think productivity wise, you have a lot of more members on board. And I'm proud that um, the team is growing even more. I mean, um, p those who are interested can always reach out to you. Of course. They can always um, ask you, oh, is it possible if I can be in the next, po next podcast? Of if course. It, is it possible to become a volunteer? Is it possible to, you know, um, help out in any way they can? Of course. And if anyone, if any of our viewers do want to volunteer or help out or even just get in touch, they can contact us via Instagram, via TikTok. They can right. email us. Right. So there's... So many different avenues of contacting us. Yes. Now you've said that you've seen the charity, the, the Dao organization increase over time. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your most proud moment? 
What would you say is your most proud moment from within something? working within the charity? So we'll do it in two stages. First was working within, and then us increasing, us um, growing, expanding. So we'll start with you working in. Mm. I would say the moment. the first project that we've started yeah. was my proudest moment because I I got my younger brother involved. He saw yes. a different side to everything, you know, and uh, I'm glad he saw a different side. He saw how how the homeless people live, and he thought. Okay, I I never want to um, come come into that position in my life because if if it was your shoes, like you said, if it if you were in those shoes of a homeless person, you would you would think, wow, I'm so lucky. Mm. And he he thought that, and you know, for him, experience is everything, especially because he's young, and he doesn't have that thought, you know, oh oh they they're homeless because they they made their life that way. It's not because of that. It's because I mean it is sort of choices, but there's a lot of factors involved as well. I mean uh, we, it's it's true that not everyone is dealt the same hand in the sense that everyone's got a different starting point in life. Yeah. Some people become rich at 50. Some people work their entire lives grinding and make it 250 with nothing. Nothing, yeah. Uh, so some people are born rich Some people are rich at 50 Everyone's got a different yeah. starting point But see we always speak about the money yeah. yes. But we never think of the other end of the spectrum Where exactly. some people have nothing mm -hmm. Now Your the, value is determined by where you go Because I There's a story okay That I just wanted it. to bring up there was, a, there was a guy He had the daughter and he said Look I have, I have this car Okay, It's an old, old GTR Nissan GTR mm. They took it to the scrapyard and they were only offered 200 pound okay 200 pound for for scraps mm. now the guy said let's go let's uh let's go try sell this car somewhere else mm. so they went to they went to um uh, a private car seller yeah and the guy s said 1000 pound now from one 200 to 1000 he thought okay i'm making 800 pounds mm. they went to a um took it to an antique um like a you know those uh, old the, the shows yeah, where yeah, they tell you the like price of antiques, old roadshow. antiques. Yeah, so they took it to an antique and they offered them um, one hundred thousand pound. Wow! So you can imagine where you take where you go. Your value is is it depends on where you uh, where you go. So try different places. If if you manage to um, do better than what the other person has offered, go for it. That's your opportunity. That's your chance. You're you're valued more. You should go to where you are valued more, right? Mm. Well, that's actually that's pretty that's pretty important. We usually don't put value as to where you go. It's usually oh, who has the most money? Yeah. Or I don't know who's got the flashiest car. Who's got the best phone? I think um, flashiest cars, stuff like that, it doesn't matter as long as a car does its job. It takes you from A to B. That's that's the main thing, you know. You don't want to put anyone down, and you don't want to big yourself too too much because evil lies a real thing, and you know you don't want problems in the future. And I I agree. When when someone's always like, and I've seen this where some people. Like their display pictures, them seated in like a car. That's probably not even theirs. No, the biggest advice that I've heard was, even if you make it in life, humble yourself. And even if you're at the lowest place, talk to talk to Allah to make things better for you. And always talk to Allah when you make it because, you know, you've never been in that position before. But thanks to Allah, you have. Well, that's, that's very well put. Now, m moving on, you've spoken about your achievement that you're most proud of whilst you are in the organization. Now, it's been a couple of years since we started. Right. What would you say is the most the most proud moment that you you've seen us, or the milestone that you've seen us do, um, in the past couple of years? I guess this this podcast is pretty new to me, so I, I'm so proud that this podcast is up and running because now that people will know more about technology, they'll know who are the board members, they'll know who are the people. They'll know what kind of events you've carried out. You can mm. talk about the events you've carried out. For example, the stores in Brick Lane. Uh, that, how long was the event? Was it two days? It Three was days? two days. Two days. Two days. Two days. Um, the first day involved um, a bouncy castle, and I think uh, that's a good attraction to have. Uh, advertising um, tarichology is very important as well because without the people, that there's no such thing as tarichology as well, right? Of course. Um, but yes, you embody the whole tarichology. <laughs> I guess uh, you are the what's the word? You are the you are the leader. You are the Captain. The captain, yeah, the captain. sure. Um, yeah. You, you order people around. So, um, <laughs> I mean, if I carried on with you, I think I would have been in the same, same oh, position, the same boat. Um, this is the founder's episode. So people, our viewers are getting a chance to see the two oh. minds that founded and started Al Ghaya Foundation, which made Tarikhology. Yeah, yeah. I mean, our personalities are different. I'm more of a, what's the word? The kind, gentle, nice approach. You're more <laughs> of the direct, straight approach. Like, this is how it should be. This is how this it is. is. This is how we get things done. 
Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you could say that our personalities, they work well together. Because they do. there are times when you need someone to be serious and you, there are times when you need someone to be a lot more sympathetic. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Don't uh, get me wrong, there's disagreements that happen as well. But of course. I think the, the main thing is how you overcome it. Exactly. I agree. And that, that's a very good point because those organizations that fail, organizations that do not succeed, usually have the issue that they either have disagreements that can't be over, like overcome yep. or... They have a lack of leadership. If I mean, if yeah, either make or break. Yeah, like, exactly. Uh, with uh, the homeless situation, I think uh, we had a dispute about probably timing. Like, uh, um, oh, can't, can't you be flexible? Oh, I remember during Ramadan, mm. it was after work, I could only help you out, yes. I remember. And you was like, oh, do you think you'd be able to help me any other day, like the weekend? Yes, I, like, I remember this, yeah. Remember? And uh, it was quite tough, but I dedicated well, yeah, myself we, to we, you, you, anyway, you, you took, And this comes down to your next point. Right. Um, or to the next point, the next question I have. What was a personal sacrifice that you had to make? Personal sacrifice? For, it is, um, personal sacrifice. What was the sacrifice that you made? As one of the charity's co-founders, as the as Al Ghaya Foundation, as one of the founders of Al Ghaya Foundation, what was the sacrifice that you made? Um, time is a sacrificing my free time was um, was key because uh, in that free time I could be doing other stuff. Of I could course. be um, what was I doing during that time? Sorry, no, uh, I was uh, maybe I was studying. Maybe I was doing my uh, workout in the park or in the mm -hmm. gym. You know. Um, so, Time slots like these, you know, when you have a busy time schedule, you you have things throughout the day. You're either at work, you're either doing exercise, you're either reading a book, you're either giving time to your family. Mm. There's a there's a million things that people do every day. Exactly. Uh, so time is definitely up there. Time sacrificing my there. time. Um, I remember the I don't... other challenges mm. that I would say is uh, talking to people. I mean, I've already had communication skills, but talking to homeless people, you don't know whether you should talk to them in this way or that way because a lot of the homeless people around the area you know they they get injected and they they do drugs and whatnot and it's like is it safe for me to go to that person is it safe for me to go because some of them are drunk as well mind you remember mm -hmm. in um Bethnal Green in front of the church there was a guy there yes, and we didn't yeah, know okay, if yeah. it was safe or not and we were fearing for our lives like which one of us should go and talk to him <laughs> and yeah. I guess uh I made the move. I told him, you yeah, don't worry, off. I'll go. I figured we've got someone. And, uh, yeah. if, if anything, I can run. I've got time to run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because uh, if anything happens to us, we don't have insurance. So mm. that was something we, we thought about. And we thought, okay, let's keep our distance. But let's see if he will be willing to talk to us. Let's see if he will be willing to, you know, give back the same energy we give. Mm. So we went to him and it worked out quite well. I mean, this is where I guess people skills are important. Not everyone has people skills. Exactly. People assume they do. Exactly. But they don't realize that when you're speaking to people that you've never met yeah. or other groups of people. Exactly. Because you, the, the way we see it is our parents are going to be like, why did you go up to that homeless person? Don't you know? What if you had a knife? What if you had this? What if, you know, it's a dangerous thing because nowadays people have knives. Mm. And you know, with homeless people, because they have no security, they'll carry whatever they want with them. Mm. So you don't know what to expect. That's you don't true. know if they have bottles. You don't know if they have... Um, what was it? Knives, bottles, or um, injection? You know the injections. You don't know. It's it's a dangerous world. See, but that it? itself is a good thing in the sense that it helps you learn how to read people. Yeah. By doing this, you you pick up so many useful skills. You learn when to approach someone. Yeah. You learn when to read, so you can read them. But their body language: Are they hostile to you? Are they being friendly to you? And you can you learn to adapt to your environments. If there's a person who's just slightly tired, you can speak to them in a specific tone. If they're angry, you can help calm them down. I mean, we haven't had, as far as I'm aware, we, could, we I don't recall us having anyone angry, but we have had a few people that were probably a bit, a bit tipsy or maybe just a bit off the, yeah. off the face. Yeah, I mean, we're not professional um, psychiatrists. We can't, we can't read them. Yeah, of course, we're, there are no diagnosis point. We're not ther forward. therapists out there. No, we're not no, here none to of that here. <laughs> give any mental advice, but we, we give what we can. As Muslims, we, we just guide them. Of course. And coming from your personal sacrifice, what lesson or insight would you say you learn from making these sacrifices? You um, put in time, I'm assuming you put in money as well. The, the we, most important lesson that I would say is you won't see the changes happen quickly. You have to give it some time. Patience is very, very um, important. It's very beautiful. Mm. Uh, it, you won't see what you reap straight away, but you, maybe later on you will because Look where we started, okay? We had nobody. It was just me and you. <laughs> and now we have a whole team of people. And uh, uh, right now I'm giving this podcast. I'm, I'm even, 
amazed that I've reached this stage of my life to even do this with you. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm guessing, uh, yeah, be patient. Um, no matter what, if, if you feel like something's not working out, keep trying, keep trying. And eventually you will make it out. That's, yes, yeah, that's a very, that's very well put. I remember when we were recording on, it was an S7 on S8. So my, it was yeah. my phone and it was, the quality was absolutely terrible. <laughs> the background, everything, we only had, it was just me yeah. and you. So yeah. we did the best that we could. You know Never give up. Um, Look at where we are now. Exactly, exactly. You know, you know, uh, you have to make do with what you have. If you have, um, for example, you had an essay. Mm. You said the quality wasn't uh, clear as it is nowadays. We 100%. have professional cameras right now, just recording us. And I would say at least we didn't have a Nokia brick, you know. So we're, we should be grateful for what we have. Exactly. Always, um, always we bring it back to you. Gratitude. Yeah, exactly. Be grateful and, uh, that you had a phone. Exactly. I mean, we have electricity. There are people in some parts of the world that don't have yeah, electricity. Exactly. The people that complain, they don't see what they what they have in front of them. They're not lucky. And you know, is the heart? It, it's not the heart's very shut off, and I think they're just blind from, from what they have. You know, and mm. they should they should change that perspective. It would make the world a better place. You know, it mm. would open up so many doors for them. Ah, that's that was very well put. So the lesson you spoke about the lessons that you've learned from your experience with now Tarikhology. Uh how has this so how's Tarikhology? And you've seen the work, you've seen obviously the website, our social media. How has that changed your view on like society and philanthropy in general? So do you think that based off of the couple of years of working, helping like non-Muslims come to Islam, helping homeless people, providing aid to them? Or even general, like, you know, like general communications with other people. I feel like this contribution is uh, very important because uh, the people that we've helped out, I don't think, okay, maybe they forgot our faces and our names, but mm. they will never forget what we've done for them. No of one course. truly forgets. You know that saying, um, never, always forgive, but never forget. Of course, I agree with but that. But then they say that if you forgive and you forget, then you're an idiot. And if they say, <laughs> if you forgive, but you don't forget, then you're the wise person, right? Mm. Um uh, you know, it's better to forgive and forget now that I, I look at both spectrums because you, you don't want to remember the bad times. Mm. You you just want to go over, you want to get over it. You want to move on with your life. Mm. You want to make sure that whatever happens is just positive from there, right? Mm. Um, I feel like a contribution is very needed. I think the homeless people we've helped, I don't think they've ever forgotten what we've done for them. Uh, they, If we put the hoodies back on, I'm sure they will recognize us instantly. Ooh. It comes to the point where they were probably at some of their lowest times. Now, when someone's at their lowest point in their life, yeah. and now someone's here helping them, we fact we came across a lot of people. Some wanted a discussion. Some wanted food. That is true. Someone, I, there were a few people that I remember. I went up to someone and I asked them, "Are you okay? Would you like some? Uh, would you like a dawa pack? Would you like some food?" Yeah. They said no to the food. They said no to pretty much everything we're providing them except right. the Quran. They exactly. didn't want the bag itself because they were like, oh, I don't need books. But no. when I offered them a copy of the Quran, I brought it out. And I, 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 uh, I opened it for them and you know we why? sat because, went through it. Because they said knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. You know, I, I do agree with that. And uh, the more you read, I think uh, if you read, uh, Quran is basically God's words, right? Yeah, God is speaking to you through, through, through the Quran. Mm. So when someone reads the Quran, it instantly touches their heart they instantly become um, a different human being. They're no longer that maybe evil or um, whatever person they, they are, you know, mm. good, evil, whatever. They instantly have create a spiritual connection the moment they start reading it, the moment they, they start opening. They're like, okay, this is not what a human being would say. Mm. You know what I mean? No, of course, definitely. And reading the Quran is the best inspiration for any human being. Yeah. Now, because I remember reading certain verses that, because what I did was I had an A4 document with verses from the Quran, like different themes. Yes, like so, sadness, sadness, anger, jealousy, anger, happy, happy, sad. Yeah, all these emotions. Yeah, exactly. And it was it was good to have it on hand because obviously you could go straight to it, spoke to them, and it was very interesting because a lot of people are genuinely appreciated, like that the conversation. Right nowadays, if you see someone. They might just be agitated and tell you to leave or leave me alone. Yeah. But none of no, we never had that reaction. Yeah, the last thing you'd want is a homeless man to chase you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, we, we were not we were not risking that. No. And uh, you know what else I found shocking? That these homeless people, they had dogs with them as well. Oh yeah. Like, but they were very because we had broken that barrier, this all comes down to the skills that you learn doing this type of work. It really helps your I'm gonna use the term people skills. Because they were very, they were most pretty much everyone was very threatening. I mean, I have, I didn't yeah. get bitten. Did you? 
No, we didn't get bitten yeah, we, because we, we, uh, we the owner was always by them. But I feel like if if someone was to harm them, then that's why. Oh, they of course, have their dog that, that, that's for security purposes. That, that that's a given. If anyone's attacked or if anything, then obviously, if anyone has a pet, the pet will defend them. But it can't always be security. I feel like it's because they have a heart too. Homeless people, they they care. Of course, uh, they're, at the end they've, of been, the day. they've been through the hardest things in life. You can't imagine the challenges they've been through because we haven't lived it. See, it's easy. And this is something that I've heard people say. I, and to some extent, I used to always think this as well, that if someone is homeless, it's because they choose to be homeless. Right. And I've heard someone say this, that if they're homeless, they deserve to be homeless because they put themselves in that position. Now, for a good portion of my life, I thought that was true mm -hmm. because I figured, okay, he's homeless. Then I don't know. He's not doing anything to help him in this situation. Right. But then, doing all of this, and you speak to people. There we had. There was a very. We had a very. We spoke to someone who was doing very well. He he was running a fam. He was running a business. Right. He was married, but then everything yeah. when everything went wrong after COVID, all when his left. wife passed right. away, right. He lost his house. He lost his job. He couldn't make the bills. Now everything was just piling on. Yeah. And it's easy for someone to say, oh, he should have just... Yeah. All this is a test. Yeah, exactly. Honestly, it's, it's a test. It's easy to say, oh, he should have done this. He should have mm -hmm. done that. But realistically, th that person saying that has never been in that scenario. Exactly. If we were in that position, do you, do you know how stressed we would be? You know yeah, imagine, how tough. Imagine your spouse passing away. You're losing the house. I don't, I don't know. You can now have to move. Now everything is just going wrong one wow. after the other. And they're doing the best that they can with the limited resources what that they, they have. have. Yeah, it's, it's very tough. It's challenging. So, yeah, I have great respect for the work of the employees within this organization. Everyone does. Yeah, everyone plays a role. That's what I've noticed. And exactly. I'm glad they have a job because if, if they didn't have a role, then why, why are they here? You know, I mean, at least they're helping you out. They're help making Tariqology bigger than it was in the past. When we first started. Of course. Everyone here, everyone part of my team, wants to be here that's the best thing yeah. that's no the thing man if you love doing what you enjoy to do keep doing it man you have to exactly like everyone's here because they want to be here yeah o obviously you have that one who says he doesn't want to be here but then when he's not here he's like oh where, where, what's happening <laughs> you know, one thing i also but, realized was the fact that okay I mean, after, after all these events you have fun exactly. you go out you play table tennis you you do so many activities that you know, people enjoy working for you. That's one thing I like about this as well. I mean, yeah, no, exactly. 100%. You, you work for the NHS. I work for the ONS. Right. And workspace or the workplace environment is important. Everyone in yeah. this team yeah. you has know, a job, barring yeah. one who's struggling. The people you have around you, it makes a difference. It makes the work life interesting. It makes it enjoyable. I don't know if the same can be said for you. <laughs> no, well, I mean... Yeah, no, if, one hundred percent. I'm I'm sure there's people that annoy you when things get serious, but after a while, it's all fun and games, right? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I run it as it should in order for it to succeed. Okay. Now, okay. obviously, we, we this could be a very social friend group, but we wouldn't get any results. Okay. So when it's run, it's run. Obviously, there are some rules. You just have to follow a few things. Yeah. But for the most yes. part, ever everyone's I'm happy sure. to be here. Everyone's getting on. But that's the best thing a team can do. Get, have fun after, have fun before. But when things are about to get serious, get serious. No, of course. You know, like, I, I think the best employee is the one that realizes that, like, say, for example, me as the one in charge, if I tell you something, mm -hmm. they should understand it's never personal. It's we've got a business aim to do. Right. Now, this is what's required of you. And if you do not reach that requirement, I will question that. Right. But it, it's never personal. And it's this just is, business. Yeah, uh, it's just business at the end of the day. And when I say it's just business, every organization yeah. is a form of business. Every charity is a business. A hospital is a business. Exactly. A school is a business because if, if it's not making money, it's not viable to survive in this economy. Right, right. So I'm just clarifying this to anyone, to the, to no, the viewers. No, of course, I agree. I agree. Because we use the term business. Yeah. We're not here to profit off other people. No, no, no. If anything, we put in money because we believe in the message. Of course. But of course. Every, every business thinks about how they can profit. Just like you said, in the NHS, the reason why I love working there is, is the people, the environment, everything um, that goes on in there. It, it's nice. We call ourselves family. Exactly. Yeah. And that's an example of a business that's needed for the public. Everything. At the end of the day, living, especially in the West, everything is a form of a business. The hospital, the yeah. fire station. You can, you can ask me right now, the people that I've worked with, we're still close. We still have contacts. We message each other. Oh, are you free to go out? Are you free to eat? Mm. Are you free to meet up? 
Are, is it is it possible for me to um, come at this time? I'll come in front of your house. I'll pick you up. I'll take you for food. You know, that stuff. I mean, you do it with me as well. Oh, of course, exactly. And we go way back. We go, we go way back. I remember yeah. we met. What, what year was it? It was year seven, right? Year seven, yeah, in secondary seven. school. In so. year seven, I remember I, your birthday. Yeah, that's when I feel like that's when I started getting close to you. This was in year seven. You you came over. I think that's the first time you've ever had a celebration for your birthday. Because yeah. I wouldn't even call it celebration. I would say it was more outgoing. It's like we went PFC. I bought you food. We went Iceland shopping. The woman even oh, asked, yes. what did I she say? That. She's like, she, she looked at, was it me or your younger brother? And yeah. she's like, oh, are you their dad? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because she thought that dad? you were our parents. <laughs> I, I cracked up. I was like. I was very tall for year seven. Uh, yeah, and I, I was I was laughing. I was like, do I look that young or do you look that old? <laughs> I don't know. But I, I cracked yeah. up. It made yeah. me laugh. You know, um, ever since that moment, after the bar- p- party celebrations, we played football together. We played football every, um, whenever we had the chance. Yeah. I think one summer you would come every single week and we would exactly. play like we with just my played. childhood friends. Yeah, yeah exactly. We, it was we, nice. It, it, was, it was very good. Now, coming back, we've only got a handful of questions left. Right. Uh, as this is the Founders Podcast, we want our audience to know who we are and why we started what we did. Right. So for anyone that's looking or anyone that's seen our podcast or anyone that's seen a charity because i don't always, i don't encourage everyone to just follow one organization no. if you like this podcast support the podcast by liking subscribing and sharing it sharing Amongst obviously if the, we have a patreon for go share can. this podcast now <laughs> <Harry Hology. laughs> we appreciate it but i'm uh, my personal opinion is if you see someone doing good you should always help them out yes if, of course don't just be strict on what I know a lot of organizations and a lot of fo- yeah. like their followers. Of course. I mean, if They're someone's very, drowning, you don't want to record them drowning. You want to be there saving them. You uh, know what I mean? Nowadays, this generation is about, oh, let's record this. They, they bring out the phone, they put the flash on and then they're just recording like, I don't know, the, like a car crash. They're just recording the crash. So people, it's, people will remember you more for saving their lives than recording them drown. Well, that's, that's, def- that's definitely true. You know what I mean? They would never forget that favor because that favor in the end can come back to you. Imagine they become the CEO of a company and you're out there looking for a job. Mm. They can say, hey, are you interested? I mean, that was a very big shift. They went from that to being the CEO. See, but in life, it's anything happens, yeah, no, you definitely. know what I mean? It's uh, a good ex- a good example. I was talking to some of the team earlier. Not today. This was maybe a couple of weeks ago. Right. There was I can't remember his name now. He worked for Prete Manger or however it's pronounced, and he started off as a. He said it correctly. Yeah, I said it correctly. Prete Manger. Okay, because I said it correctly, yeah. I request everyone to subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But uh, he was working there as a normal. Uh, what do you call it, like a barista? He was a barista and then he started off like, then became like a team lead. Then he went up and after 20 years, he worked his way up to the CEO role. Like uh-huh. that's, that is amazing. He, he See? stuck by that company for yeah. 20 years. Yeah. No, not even that, you know, before we- And you even, have now people like, that don't even want to be there for five minutes, for like five days. They're like, it's too long. Yeah. It's very um, prolonged hours. I think, uh, you know, you know, before we started this podcast in the car, you were showing me, uh, what did you show me? Uh, this guy, he he has his own podcast. Yes. And uh, before that, he was telling people, can you jump on my podcast? Mm. Now look where he is. Yeah, He's yeah. out here telling people, don't come on my podcast. Make sure you pay me £10,000 before you jump on my podcast. I right? agree 100%. I, he's got, he, when he posted that video, when I saw yeah. that video and I looked at, yeah. I looked for his podcast. Yeah. Because I was just eager to see it. Oh, no, not eager. I, think, I was curious. Yeah. Don't expect people to help you out when you didn't even help them his the podcast place, has you know what, I mean? what over what a hundred thousand subscribers now hundred thousand wow over that i don't know exactly don't quote me on that right but it, it's very big now right. for anyone that's lo- watching this podcast and they want to provide something back to the community but they don't want to reinvent the wheel mm. what what advice do you have for someone that wants to get into charity work or the dawah for example no um volunteering is the way to go obviously uh like i said um, earlier i'll reach out to amno he will definitely help you out if uh, if you're willing to volunteer, if you're willing to make contributions. Um, honestly, go do the community work. If you see that some, if you feel like you have so much spare time, see what you can do for the community. See if there's any any events going on. If you can um, hold on to stores, um, do some charity work that will benefit you and everyone else. Um, yeah, definitely um, follow up on this podcast. Um, reach out to. Uh, what, what else did you say? Did you say how else they can um, so, volunteer? Yeah, so if someone is interested... If they're interested... Uh, what what advice do you have for someone who's interested but not sure if they should do it? Okay, definitely speak to someone. 
Okay. Um, come out to I mean, you can come to me, and I can uh, definitely give you some. The advice. viewers can always contact us via yes. our social media, our Instagram, YouTube. Yeah. It'll TikTok. be attached to this video you know, anyway, so it'll be, um, all links will be in the description, so right. they can find us through that. Yeah, I know there's a lot of people that are lost or they want to contribute. Like they they have this burning desire, this fire in them that you know they want to they want to do good in the world. They don't want to be remembered as oh. It's, it's a nobody They want to be remembered as Oh someone This is someone that Wanted to do um, charity work This mm. is someone that Did charity work This yeah. is someone that Contributed to this And he is remembered for this Yeah You know Coming to the we're, we're coming to the Closing portion Of the podcast We've only got Like We've only got two questions left Okay What are So one of the questions What was one of the biggest challenges That you faced During this entire journey Within the charity or outside of the charity? Well, let's start with the within. Okay. What was the biggest uh, challenge you faced and why? The biggest challenge, uh, um, apart from time, I would say was... Money? Yeah, funds Funds would be it. But I can't make that an excuse because I also had a job. That's um, true. See, and I, I love the way you phrase that because we... And I say we because we're all guilty of it to some extent. Where we, we cheap out when it comes to like Islam or like... Right. Providing back to people Right Especially when you wake up In the morning And you're like oh, Do I really have to go And you know Help Aminor out With this charity do I, do I have the time Do I have the effort There you go See look It's, it's, it's easy it's, to It's easy to have that Like come to that conclusion yeah. it, That goes with anything though When you go to work Exactly yeah At the end of the day It comes down to your personal choice What do you really value Right If you What do you prioritize What do you Exactly I, I, I love the way you, you phrase that Priorities are key Now if your Concern is for other people Especially, and let's say, not, let's say not your immediate family, but for your local people, mm. then if everyone took, and this is my personal belief, if everyone was concerned for their local community, mm. there would be no community violence. There would be no drugs. There would be no, there would be no knife crime. There'd be right. none of that. Right. Even because, because of the fact that everyone's concerned, everyone's mm. looking out for everyone's it. Everyone's trying to stop it. Yeah, they're not looking, they're not batting an eye saying, yeah. that's not my business. Yeah, why, 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 why does knife crime, why, why do drugs, why is that all an issue? Because... People are like, oh, provided we stay inside, it's not going to happen. There's a lot of factors involved. It's upbringing as well. You have upbringing, to one hundred percent. You don't know if the parents are fit to raise their. Oh, we can't even speak. We're not parents. Yeah, well, we're, we're not going to get to that side of things because that's yeah. where. I mean, obviously, we're not parents. We can't, we can't blame parents at this point. I mean, we, we but we, what we can say is we have, we can say that the children shouldn't overstep the boundary of the parent. Of shouldn't course. tell the parents what's wrong and right. If the parents said this is wrong. This is right. Just stick to that. Obviously, if you have your own opinions about what's wrong and right, then keep that to yourself. And if you feel like um, you're not sure, just speak to someone about it. Don't um, don't go and do the wrong thing. Yeah, of course, because usually the parents have life experience that the child doesn't have. Exactly. Like I mean, a, a seven-year-old won't be telling his parents, "I want to do this, this, and this." The parents <laughs> are not just going to agree with it. Can you imagine a seven-year-old goes out and says, "Mom, today I feel like taking this knife out." No, that's. That's not that's not something that's practical. It's not going to happen that way, you know what I mean? But there have been cases where, you know, kids, they've gone into school with knives and they've been caught and they've been suspended from school. Of so, course. I mean, not know, only is that heavily illegal, but that's obviously a danger yeah. to life. Yeah, and I feel like that's that's a mental that's a mental issue that someone uh, that everyone, you know, fights with in their selves. Mm. Like uh they they probably wake up and think, "Okay, today I'm not feeling right." At least um, you know, give yourself a wake-up call. Tell yourself that you know, you respect yourself, you love yourself. Self-love is important. Make sure you pray for your, make sure you pray all your five daily salahs, not just for your, and you know, you'll see things will be better for you. Make constant dua and um, yeah, life will go the direction you want it to go, right? Okay, nice. Our last question for today's um, episode. What legacy do you want to leave behind? As one of the co-founders of mm. Now Tarikhology, what would you, what would you, you want your legacy to be? My legacy, it's very broad, but I would say uh, Tarikhology to become um, an even bigger team, um, become something up there like, uh, what's one of the biggest charities that you know of? Uh, like, uh, so we work Human with Aid, right? Human or Aid, Muslim Aid. Muslim Aid. Yeah, yeah, something like that. So distributing food packages to all over the world, you know? Mm. We can start off with like, uh, what is it, Africa? Mm. Or uh, the less fortunate kids that are out there. Or for example, um, obviously the situation around the world is not looking good right now, but mm. the people that really need the food, uh, shout out to, let's say Egypt, um, Palestine, uh, what else? Afghanistan because of mm. the earthquake, Turkey, you know, places any, like Any that. country that needs or requires aid, 
we, we would aim to help provide that aid? At the moment, um, I know there are some charities that are helping from Egypt, mm. carrying food trucks and aid packages to to uh, Gaza, mm. and they're helping people who are going through the unfortunate. One events. of the organizations, uh, and you know this, but for the viewers, I don't know this. One of the organizations that we used we work closely with, Save the Children. They work Save across the, the world, yeah, and they're currently working in that um, specific vicinity, helping the. They they usually focus on the orphans, but. Yeah. Helping the people around there. Yeah. I guess, you know, uh, the Prophet also said that whatever charity you leave behind is accounted for. Like, for example, you know, when you plant a seed, mm. that's one of the charities that um, you can leave behind for kids. Because after you die, people eat from that tree and you're gaining yeah, reward from that tree, right? So it, from that tree, you can you can get fruits, you can grow vegetables. Um, what else? Um, a lot of things, right? Like rice. Fruits and vegetables are produce. The, the, main, the main, you know, the main things in life mm. uh, I guess giving that is something that uh, tarikhology can uh, in, involve in introduce later on uh, you know planting seeds or uh, helping kids with mm. uh, the food uh, a shelter because mm. you don't know if people are still you know living in tin sheds or mm. uh, you know back home you know back home the, the land is um, yeah the land is very rough very back rough. home yes. when we say back home we should be specific I mean Bangladesh mm, yeah in Bangladesh. I um, mean, for me, as the, the other co-founder, what, what would I want my legacy to be? It's pretty simple. Uh, yes. We want continuity. After we die, yes, this should not end. No, no, no. Now, if should. if it ends, we've done something wrong, and I what that's what I think yeah. about a lot of organizations where when management changes, right? Let's say the founder passes away, right? Or let's say I don't know the management now get the the founder gets or someone gets fired, the management changes and the company now takes a hit, yeah, and goes down. That founder did not do his job properly, or the manager or the okay. the, the board did not do their job properly right. because they should have trained or they should have policies in place Impo involved. Yes, so, which protect yeah. the organization from these types of problems. Right. So um, this is something that a lot and of we'll companies end on this use. Point. Yeah, a lot of companies have um, SOPs. Mm. Uh, they're known as stand standard operating procedures, procedures yeah. and their documentation. So the reason why they're not on paper is because the 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 writing could be changed. Mm. And wh when it's on um, computer based, um, at least it's saved. Nothing can be changed. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. If you wanted to change it, at least we can see who reviewed it, who edited it. Exactly, yeah. You know? You know? This is very important. So having procedures, like you said, is very, very key. Um, the the Like you said, the legacy you leave behind, I, w I want to be remembered for being... Um, a very good human being. Of course. I mean, um, who would A good Muslim, you know, at the and end of the day. That's also very true. And uh, I want to be remembered for uh, being a co-founder of Tarikhology. You know, this this sign is very beautiful and it stands out. Yeah, and it took I, this... I, it, it, it took a lot of work, This right? took a long time to design. Work, like, uh, it the, looks very look simple. The, look, at the, look at the design, it's beautiful. I don't know how you came up with that. Oh, I was crying throughout the entire <laughs> evening just trying to come up with a very good design. Right. Only because I wanted it to be simple but elegant enough so that it yeah you it's never know attractive yeah you never know one day you might see um, uh, tarikhology in people's houses. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, know? sure. I mean, I don't know how that would work, but <laughs> I guess yeah, we could. Yeah, tarikhology mugs. In, as in um, mugs. Tarikhology okay. mugs. Mugs or or, or, or the dawa packs. Or the dawa packs. See, the I mean? dawa packs are probably the best thing that we provide that a lot of organizations don't. Yeah. Because of the fact that. The Dawah Packs are accessible and it's got everything that you would require for a new Muslim yeah. Yeah. or someone interested in Islam. I, I think we will be remembered for the Dawah Packs. I, I think, think we um, should be, forget the Dawah Packs, I think we should be remembered for taking the initiative to do it. Yeah. Everyone yeah, says they want to do they it. They want to do it. They want to. How yeah. many people have put it into it. practice? Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, by putting it into practice, we've made our goals more achievable. Oh, 100%. We've uh, made it possible. Well, that's the end of the podcast. I want to appreciate, show my appreciation to you for taking your time well, out. It's, it's been a pleasure to be on this podcast. Honestly, I'm honored to have, be a guest on this podcast. This is my third, first, first, first podcast ever. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. Well, um, it was my pleasure. Maybe in the future upcoming podcast, I'll, I'll be involved. No, more. inshallah. I definitely will have you working alongside us. Inshallah. Now that you've inshallah. got a bit more free time, we can make arrangements. I also, wanna, I also wanna thank the team for all their hard work yeah. in making all of this possible. And also we've got a lot of upcoming plans. Yeah. And I also wanna thank our subscribers and our followers for all of the support that they've shown us and our videos. And I just requested everyone if they could just like, share and subscribe. 
Because that, in essence, as you said earlier, is how we can grow. Go like, share and subscribe. <laughs> and with that, I'd like to cut off by saying as alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ya wazi al